Okay, I think we're ready now. So for those of you who have just logged in, hello and welcome to the webinar. My name is Martin Boffey and I'm the Marketing Projects Manager at Appiaison. And today's webinar is entitled, Greece is the Word. Just before I introduce the presenters, there's a couple of housekeeping points to note. Um, your mics will uh, be auto-muted during the webinar today. Uh, this is to avoid any background noise uh, interfering during the presentation. However, you can uh, ask questions by using the side panel on the webinar platform, uh, which should be sat to the right-hand side of your screen. Uh, and then what will happen is at the end of the webinar, uh, we'll sort of try and answer as many of the questions as possible before we run out of time. And should we have any questions outstanding, then uh, obviously we'll, uh, you know, we'll, we'll get back to everybody within 24 hours of the, uh, the webinar. Okay, uh, so today we're going to be discussing some of the key considerations that are required when specifying the correct vacuum grease for various applications. And uh, to do this, I'm pleased to be joined by three members of the APIs on team. Firstly is Penelope Livesey, who is our applications engineer at APIs on. Penny has a background in chemistry with a master's in chemistry with nanotechnology, and she manages our distributor partners as well as answering any technical queries about the APIs on product range. Also joining us is Dominic Cole, who is the commercial manager for Appiaison. Dom will be familiar to a number of our partners listening today, as he spends a lot of time traveling and developing key relationships around the world. And finally, our customer services coordinator, Stephanie Stockton, will also be presenting during the webinar. Based at our head office here in the UK, Steph may also be familiar to some of our attendees today, as she looks after both the Appiaison customers and partners to make sure they're happy with the products and services they receive. Steph is also one of our longest service members who started back in 1979 in the MI Materials Lab. So, uh, with the introductions over, I'll pass you to Steph first, who will begin this webinar with what a vacuum is and how the vacuum greases work. Steph. Thanks, Martin. Hello, everyone. What is a vacuum? Well, one definition is a space entirely devoid of matter. In a lab setting, we generally think of creating a vacuum as creating a space with so few particles, they do not affect any processes being carried out there. So once we've created a vacuum, how do we measure it? Well, vacuum can be measured in a number of ways. Common units include millibar, atmosphere or tor, after the physicist and mathematician Torricelli. Here at Appiaison, we tend to use tor, but conversion is easy. A thousand millibar equals 760 tor, which equals one atmosphere, which is the nominal pressure of air around us. Vacuum is generally represented on a logarithmic scale, as shown here. In course of primary vacuum, which is where most lab pumps operate, up to 99.999% of the gas is removed. Specially designed pumps such as turbo molecular pumps can be used to create a higher vacuum level, possibly even exceeding what we would describe as high or ultra high vacuum. And then to give an idea of the extreme end of the scale, space. These categories can be subjective, so we tend to clarify with the customer what vacuum level they actually mean if they describe it as high or ultra high. Appiaz on Greece works up to what we would describe as the ultra high range with both our PFPE 501 Greece and Appiaz on L Greece. Maintaining the correct level of vacuum for the process or application is highly important. Many of the processes completed under vacuum are expensive and labour intensive, not to mention the cost of maintaining the vacuum level as well. It is essential to understand each part of your vacuum system and ensure you are using the right material in the right area, including the right grease. So what considerations go into choosing the right grease for the vacuum? I'm going to pass you over to Penny for the next selection of this webinar to explain what you should be thinking about when making your selection. Thanks, Steph. If you aren't familiar with the chemistry of greases and materials designed for vacuum use, you might be wondering what makes vacuum greases different to the type of grease you might find in the DIY section of the local supermarket. Firstly, the vapour pressure. This is the measure of volatility at a given temperature. 
and it is an inherent property of all organic substances. The substance will boil if the vapour pressure becomes higher than the ambient pressure. If you think of boiling water, the ambient pressure stays the same. It's one atmosphere, or 760 torr if you've been paying attention. At 25 degrees Celsius, the water doesn't boil. But if you increase the temperature to 100 degrees Celsius, then you can see it boiling and evaporating. You might have heard of or seen the effect of decreasing the pressure on boiling water when at high altitudes. Water will boil below 100 degrees Celsius at the top of a mountain. Outgassing is another consideration for a vacuum grease. The image on the left signifies a typical all-purpose, not vacuum grease. The material is made up of a mixture of different molecules, some larger shown by the white circles here and some smaller. Each of the molecules will have a different vapour pressure. If the material is held under vacuum, the molecules with a higher vapour pressure can be outgassed, as demonstrated. These could then be deposited elsewhere in the system, causing contamination. In a grease such as Apiazon on the right, the lower vapour pressure molecules are removed during manufacture of the grease. This leads to very low outgassing properties. That's highly important for use in optical equipment and the like. It is so important to NASA that they have developed a test to determine if materials have low enough outgassing properties for their applications. Uh, and all the results of outgassing in the Apiazon range are available on the NASA website. So we've talked a lot about vapour pressure, but how does that relate to the vacuum grease choice? Here we have the vapour pressure graphs of three different Apiazon greases. It's important to note the logarithmic scale. The temperature dependence is exponential. So small increases in temperature can seriously affect the grease choice. When you're choosing a grease, our experts recommend checking the vapour pressure at all the temperatures you're going to be operating at. If you're using Apiazon grease, it's, this is simple. You'll find these graphs for all of our products across their entire working temperature range on our website. Simply put, you need to stay above the line. If your vacuum is 1 times 10 to the minus 10 torr, as shown here, and your system will be maintained at 15 degrees Celsius, then L grease will work for you, but N and M would not. If you increase the temperature up to 25 degrees Celsius and maintain the same vacuum level, then L grease would no longer be an option. In this case, our PFPE-based grease, PFPE 501, would be the grease of choice. As I mentioned earlier, outgas grease could be deposited elsewhere in the system. Uh, it could end up inside the pump oil, and then you'd need to change the oil more frequently. Or more worryingly, it could be deposited in the experiment or product. For some applications, even the smallest amount of contamination could have severe consequences. Yields can also be affected by a poor vacuum. For example, during a distillation, the separation between molecules would be very poor. Oxygen ingress can cause oxidation as well, especially during processes at elevated temperatures. The image here was taken following a critical experiment where severe oxidation occurred. Instead of a clear yellow liquid, a dark brown material is formed with solid deposits, commonly referred to as sludge. The oxidation products in organic reactions can be varied and very difficult to remove. In many cases, a leak in the vacuum means starting over from scratch, and that's costly and very irritating. So you've identified that you need a vacuum grease, and you can read the vapour pressure graph to choose the product which will work under your vacuum conditions. But what else do you need to think about? Well, we touched a little on temperature when we looked at how it affects vapour pressure. But like all materials, greases can melt or thermally decompose if they get too hot. Often, melting doesn't cause long-term harm to the grease, but it will affect the seal if it uh, becomes liquid or moves away from the site of application. If your application could get hot, ensure that you're using a product such as Apiazon H grease or PFP501 as these are designed for the high temperatures. And again, check the vapour pressure at the upper operating temperature. At low temperatures, most greases will begin to crack as they freeze. These cracks can be microscopic, and that's known as crazing, but this can still cause leaks or other issues. For example, if you're using the grease as a heat transfer agent, then cracks will affect the thermal conductivity. 
As we discussed when choosing a grease for a high temperature application, make sure the grease you use is designed to be cold if needed. Thermal cycling between room and colder temperatures should also be considered. For many applications, you need to be able to rely on the grease to cycle without affecting the consistency. Appiaise on end grease is designed to be used at cryogenic temperatures without cracking or crazing. It is often used by researchers as a sample mount medium at cryogenic temperatures as it has a high thermal conductivity. Uh, there are research papers published by NASA available for further information on the thermal conductivity of Appiaise on end grease. Uh, the grease also has a proven track record in responding well to thermal cycling. Some applications require extra lubricity. Choosing the correct grease for a bearing or gearbox can be quite complicated, so I've just included a few considerations to help with the decision. ASTM D2596 is a standard test method for measuring the ability of a grease to prevent wear um, when you test it under extreme pressure and heavy loads. The results are expressed in kilograms, and then you can compare this between greases to determine the right one for you. Base oil viscosity is also often used. Uh, conventional greases are made up of a base oil and that provides the lubrication and then a thickener which holds the grease in place. You can use the viscosity of the base oil to determine if it will work in the bearing or system using a series of calculations. Appiaison's hydrocarbon range are not conventional greases, however, for the most part. Uh, they are based on a pure hydrocarbon semi-solid feedstock instead. AP101 and PFP501 are the only greases in the range with a base oil viscosity. Choosing the wrong grease for gearboxes or bearings can lead to high levels of friction and then that can cause overheating and damage to your system. If you would like advice on choosing the right grease for your gearbox or bearings, please do get in touch. Um, I'll share the contact details at the end of the webinar. Compatibility of the materials is another big consideration. Some all-ring materials are not compatible with some types of grease. In this case, the most common issue is swelling of the o-ring, and that leads to a poor fit and potential vacuum leaks. In extreme cases, the o-ring could crack or even break, as demonstrated here, and, and then you could end up with it completely breaking down and depositing residue into the system and causing further leaks. Appiaise on hydrocarbon greases are compatible with many types of o-ring material, such as biotin, silicone and nitrile. Appiaise on PFP501 is very inert and is compatible with all commonly used O-ring materials. We do have compatibility information for all of our products on their technical data sheets. Uh, and if you're working with a material which is not listed, please feel free just to ask us. If you're producing a product intended for consumption, then you need to use a food grade grease with a suitable rating. NSF H1 food grade is the most common applied to greases. It's designed for greases used where incidental food contact might occur. For example, in vacuum pumps, mixers and conveyor belts on sites where food is produced. PFP501 is NSF H1 certified and can be used in these environments. The final content must not exceed 10 parts per million, otherwise the food is deemed unsafe for human consumption. So to quickly summarise this section, I've covered five key points to consider when choosing your grease. One, vapour pressure. And remember, this is exponential, so make sure you check at all the temperatures you plan to use. Two, temperature range you need to avoid melting or cracking of the grease. Three, do you need any extra lubricity? Four, is the grease compatible with all your materials? And five, if applicable, then it's an important point to note. Do you need to check the food safety rating of the grease? Once you've identified all your needs in a grease, you'll need to find the right product. Here at Appiaison, between our seven hydrocarbon greases and our PFPE501 grease, we're confident we cover most vacuum applications. We are able to provide sealing and heat transfer down to cryogenic temperatures with Appiaison N grease. And Appiaise on H grease and PFP501 can be used up to 240 and 250 degrees Celsius, respectively. We also have products which can be used even at ultra high vacuum. I'll pass you back to Steph now to tell you a little about Appiaison's history. 
Thanks, Penny. M&I Materials takes its name from the Mike and Knight and Insulator Company. From this grew to become Metropolitan Vickers, a large UK manufacturing and research company based in Trafford Park, Manchester. In 1926, a research engineer by the name of Bill Birch was working at Metropolitan Vickers here in Manchester. Bill Birch was developing low vapour pressure oils as part of a different experiment, but discovered that these oils could be used to replace mercury in diffusion pumps. He called his new products apiazon, meaning without pressure in Greek. Apiazon vacuum pumps were then used in the Cavendish lab at Cambridge University, where under the guidance of Rutherford, Cockcroft, also ex-Metropolitan Vickers, and Walton, designed their proton accelerator to reveal the lithium nuclei. Apiazon products continued to be developed down the years following the path of innovation first set out by Birch. Today we have a range of products used for applications that he and those early pioneers could only dream about, and possibly they did. Apiazon is used today in a wide variety of applications by thousands of customers worldwide. Our commercial manager, Dom, is going to run through a few examples and how the choice of which product was made. Thanks for that, Steph. So our first case study is an example from the astronautics industry. Being a, a limited number of materials able to be used in space, Apiazon products have many uses from satellites through to rockets. In this example, our customer was designing a spacecraft to fly through the tail of a comet to bring a sample back to Earth. So they contacted experts at Apiazon to recommend a sealant for the electronic chassis, and we were given a number of requirements for this. First and foremost, a vacuum grease was needed for compatibility with Viton. The grease was required to keep the seal as low as minus 40 and as warm as plus 66. So for end grease, we'll look at those requirements in turn. Vacuum grease, yes for the whole range. Compatibility with Viton, yes. In fact, all Apiazon greases are compatible with Viton. A minimum temperature of minus 40, yes. Uh, we'd usually recommend end grease, but it will melt if used above room temperature. So as shown in the right hand column, we can look at end grease, uh, H grease rather, uh, and this could be used up to 240 degrees. It's a vacuum grease, it's compatible with Viton, its maximum temperature is plus 240 degrees, and for the, for the minimum temperature of minus 40, we had a question mark. We thought it might be uh, suitable based on its formulation, but we didn't have the data to, to back it up, so we suggested they give it a try, and we sent the sample, and it worked out very well appears on H grease, sealed the electronic chassis and went into space on this mission. So moving away from space and into the lab now, apiazon greases are very popular for distillation applications. For those not familiar with distillation, it's a method used to separate materials according to the boiling points. A mixture of liquids is heated in a flask, shown on the left, until the lower boiling point fraction evaporates. Water runs through the condenser tube at the top, cooling back to room temperature, causing the gas to condense and collect in the vessel, shown on the right. Distillation is commonly performed under vacuum, and this has a few benefits. Firstly, it lowers the, the, the boiling point so the lower temperatures can be used. This is great for energy consumption and safety, but also critical for when materials could be high, affected by high temperatures. In this example, showing the hot end of distillation, the technician has used Apiazon PFPE 501. In this experiment, the flask is heated to plus 150 degrees. PFPE 501 is, is superb for kind of glassware applications for this. It's very slippy and prevents glassware from seizing. The temperature withstand can be up to 250 degrees, and it's important for many of our customers that it's NSF H1 food grade, as Penny mentioned earlier. An alternative apiazon grease used in hot side distillation and in other lab applications is apiazon H grease, which is a hydrocarbon based grease capable of 240 degrees C. 
going what to pe going back to to what Penny uh, covered earlier in the graph about vapor pressures increasing exponentially with temperature. In order to use a grease, even under a medium vacuum at these temperatures, it has to be a specially designed vacuum grease. Both Apiase on H and PFPE 501 are formulated to withstand high temperature and vacuum environments. But as always, we recommend that you check the vapor pressures before beginning. So let's move on to the cold end of distillation. So for this collection vessel, almost any hydrocarbon vacuum grease would be suitable. The standard vacuum pumps being used, so we're in the low to medium vacuum range. The collection vessel is at room temperature, so there are no temperature considerations, but there is a concern in the lab that it's got to be kept completely silicone free due to the manufacture of other materials where silicone could cause serious damage. It's not uncommon for a lab to be silicone completely banned uh, in the lab. Hydrocarbon greases are often used around the collection vessel due to their resistance to creep. These greases stay where they're applied and importantly don't cause contamination into the receiver itself. So here, end grease was used. It has a specific rubbery texture which makes it ideal for fragile glass applications. Many lab techs around the world have end grease as their first choice for room temperature due to this unique texture. So our final example today is the use of end grease in superconducting applications. End grease is designed not to crack at low temperatures and is used worldwide by institutions such as NASA, CERN and the Rutherford Appleton lab here in the UK as a sample mount medium inside a cryostat. More recently we've been able to demonstrate that the grease is so, so thermally conductive at cryogenic temperatures that it can be used as a heat transfer material around a superconductor. The video here was recorded by Stitch in Reno, a charity in the Netherlands who perform science experiments to school children. They're using end grease to protect the superconductor, demonstrating the Meissner effect. Their superconductors would normally degrade after about 50 cycles of heating and cooling. They contacted APIAs on experts to ask if we could recommend a material to protect the superconductor. We recommended end grease. They found that due to the high thermal conductivity, they were able to perform the experiment at 77 Kelvin with the superconductor completely encased in end grease housed in a little aluminium box. After 264 cycles, the superconductor was inspected and showed no degradation at all, and the end grease provided a barrier to the moisture. So this is a nice example, but how does it relate to a real life application? Fusion, fusion energy is currently a huge area of research. If it can be used to generate net electricity, it will be a step towards the world becoming a carbon neutral place. So heat transfer materials used in fusion energy are required to have a high thermal conductivity with very low cryogenic temperatures. Appears on H grease has been successfully used at cryogenic temperatures as a heat transfer material. The benefit of H grease is it doesn't melt and is also used in superconducting applications where a magnet might quench or perhaps require a bake out. Both N and H greases are electrically insulating. So I hope this has given you a short insight into a few of our grease applications and how uh, we'd recommend your grease choice. And um, just to say, there are so many app appears on applications that we may do a future webinar based entirely on case studies. So if you'd like further information, please get in touch. Thanks very much for listening. OK, great. Thank you to Penny, Dom and Steph for taking us through uh, today's webinar. I uh, hope all of you attending found the information presented interesting and that it's provided you some direction on what factors influence vacuum grease selection. We've had a few questions come in during the webinar, uh, which I'll put to our technical expert, Penny, and we'll try to answer as many as possible before we finish. As I mentioned at the beginning of the webinar, though, uh, we, if we are unable to uh, you know, get, cover all of them that have been asked at the time, we will respond over the next uh, couple of days back to the questions that have been asked.
Okay, so looking through here, I'll start with, a, 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 there's one coming this morning, but it's also came in in yesterday's webinar as well, and it, it is a quite a popular question. Uh, using acetone for cleaning L grease, uh, is, it, is there a better grease? Because it doesn't seem to work very well according to this question here. Uh, yes, there is. If you're using acetone, all that you're doing is um, kind of forcing the grease away with the action of squeezing it out of a bottle. It's none of the hydrocarbon greases are soluble in acetone. They are soluble in um, toluene or xylene or any other aromatic hydrocarbon solvent. And actually, warm soapy water also works quite well. So our normal advice is to first wipe away as much of the grease as possible and then give a quick rinse with either warm soapy water or an aromatic hydrocarbon solvent. And then if you really wanted to, you could use a bit of acetone just to make sure the area is clean and dry before you continue with the experiment. Right. OK, thank you for that. Great. Thanks, Penny. Um, another one here. Uh, somebody's got a, a tube of H grease uh, that's been open for quite a bit, of, uh, quite a bit of time. Um, you know, if it's been unused, how long does it actually last when it's been opened? The shelf life of IPAs on greases if they're unopened, is 10 years from the date of manufacture. If you've opened it, then obviously we can't guarantee that it will still be okay. But actually, um, in general, it's not going to come to any harm. It does, the, well, the hydrocarbon greases do have a powerful gettering action. So they will absorb small amounts of gas and other hydrocarbon molecules, especially from the air. Um, so over time, they could, if, especially if left open, they could absorb quite a lot, which could then potentially be outgassed. If practically, though, if you just um, take the lid off, use it and replace the cap straight away, you'll probably get pretty much the 10 years out of it. OK, right. Great. Thank you for that. Um, another one here. We've obviously talked about heat transfer, uh, et cetera, a few times during the webinar. Um, do uh, appears and greases conduct electricity? Um, no, all of the hydrocarbon range are electrically insulated. Um, and if you want further data on that, we do have some properties listed on the technical data sheets or feel free to get in touch with us. But they are classed as insulators. Right. OK, great. Thanks for that. And we have got a couple of other questions that have come in uh, during the webinar, but they're actually quite specific uh, application um, sort of questions, which I don't think we're going to be able to answer in time because we're just, just pretty much out of time now. Um, so uh, what we'll do is we'll respond to those after the webinar. Um, but, uh, you know, just before we go, Penny, can you sort of enlighten um, the, the, the listeners uh, as to any current product developments that we've, we've got working on at the PAs and at the moment? Uh, we do have an, a dedicated innovations team at m and Materials, and they work with all of the, um, the product groups that you can see on the bottom of your screen here. Um, so we do have someone working on innovations full time at Appiaison. I can't say too much about what we're working on at the moment, but we are always open to new ideas. So if you've got a problem that you can't solve with our current range, please let us know and we'll see what we can do. OK, great. Thanks very much for that, Penny. Um, and indeed, uh, thanks again to our presenters today, uh, Dom, Steph and Penny. And thank you to all of you for joining us and listening. And until the next Appiaison webinar, please stay safe and best wishes from all the team at Appiaison. Goodbye.